Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, we're going to continue our study as we look at verses 24 through 33. We've been talking about the king's teaching on opposition and we continue with the king's teaching on persecution. Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 through 33. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we commit this time to you and our hearts to you. And Lord, I pray for each and every person who's listening. Lord, I pray that for the person who is discouraged, that they would be encouraged. Lord, I pray for the person who is experiencing ongoing persecution, ridicule, isolation, distancing by family and friends and a culture and a community. Lord, I pray that we would be strengthened for the task at hand. Lord, I pray that you would once again remind us that the truth is worth believing, living, celebrating, and speaking. And so, Father, for the person who is just a little bit shy, for the person who's just a little bit reluctant, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them for the task at hand, that they would be willing to speak the truth in love, not when it's convenient, but when it's difficult and inconvenient. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 24, Jesus continues, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I also will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. In the 10th chapter of Matthew, Jesus is given instructions to the apostles on the short-term mission that they're about to embark on. Remember, he says, preach God's word, that the gospel of the kingdom is near. In verse 7, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons in verse 8, bless and curse worthy towns and unworthy towns in verses 11 through 15. The enemies of God will hate them in verses 16 through 18. And again in verse 23. Persecution will come from religious authorities in verses 16 and 17. Political authorities in verse 18. Sometimes even family and friends in verses 21 through 23. But Jesus says, be encouraged. The Lord is going to give you the right word at exactly the right time in exactly the right way in verses 19 through 20. Three times in this passage, Jesus will say, fear not, verse 26. Fear not, verse 28. Fear not, verse 31. 
I think that the reason why he repeats this so many times is because the pain and the hostility and the difficulty is going to be a little intimidating. We can't ignore persecution, but we don't have to be afraid of it, he says. Why? Because we know that the Lord really cares about us in verse 29 through 31. God is faithful and we can remain loyal in the presence of opposition. We can remain faithful in the presence of persecution. We can remain committed in the presence of rejection. So Jesus begins and he says, we won't Ignore the persecution in verses 24 and 25. Look what it says again. A disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. The passage is a warning and so is the statement. No disciple is above his teacher. In what sense? The Lord will suffer rejection, persecution, opposition and so will the disciple. Here Jesus speaks of the fact of the expectation and the fact of the persecution. Jesus calls his disciples, remember in the passage, to himself with a message from himself, empowering them by his own power. And then he sends them from himself. Jesus empowers them. How did people receive Jesus? Some of them accepted him. Most of them rejected him. Matthew Henry wrote, quote, Christ's followers cannot expect better treatment in the world than their master had, unquote. And that's true. And that's the point. Jesus is in effect saying, in all of your dealings with everyone everywhere, I want you to be aware of how they treated me. And you should take that as a clue of how you will be treated. In verse 25, that's why he says, it is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of the household? I want you to note the statement in verse 25. It is enough. Don't overlook it. When Jesus says it is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher, packed in that single statement is a powerful reality. God has done everything for the believer. It is enough. It, you don't know it yet, perhaps. Because at this particular moment, you may know that Jesus came and that he loves you and that he died for you and that he rose from the dead and he's sending a powerful Holy Spirit to, to live inside of you. He's orchestrating a mechanism so that everything you need will be given to you. It is enough. God has done enough for the believer and Christ has done enough for the disciple. I want you to think about this again. Because you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, there's something else that I want you to do for me. What is that? I want you to guarantee that I'm going to live a life free of pain, free of sorrow, free of suffering, free of persecution. Is that the life you've been guaranteed in Christ? That is not the life. But he's made a provision in each and every one of those instances. The Lord has exalted the believer. The Lord has given the believer impressive privileges. When we experience persecution, I want you to think about this. When we experience persecution, we are in exalted company. We join the ranks of all of the Bible people who've experienced rejection and opposition. What greater privilege can anyone have than to call Jesus my master and my Lord? Paul writes 
in Philippians chapter 1 verse 29, for unto you is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Some of you might want to blot that out of the passage or, or remove it from your Bible. But Paul doesn't play any such game. Our master and teacher loves us. Our master and teacher gave us a message. Jesus invites us to live in humility and submission and obedience to God. We are invited to live righteous lives. And the moment that you accept the invitation, the watching world is not going to be happy with the choice that you've made. No wonder in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Paul writing to Timothy said, Yes, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So when he says it's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master, if they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Who are the members of his household? That's you. To everyone believes that's the person that he gave the right to be called the children of God. You see, people who go into your household are usually family members or friends. Who goes into your home? Your children, your grandchildren, they're members of your family. Samuel Rufford put it this way. If you were not strangers here, the dogs of the world would not bark at you. And that's exactly right. Whatever the world did to the master, they'll do to the people in the household. And the word Beelzebub means the Lord of the flies or the God, small g of filth. By the way, this Lord of the Flies or the God of Filth was one of the names that was used to identify Satan both in the Old Testament and now here. This was also the small G-O-D of the Philistine city of Ekron. You can find that out in, in 2 Kings chapter 1 in verse 2 and 3 and then again in chapter 6 verse 16. What's interesting about their belief system was they believed that flies or this supernatural God had the ability to bring forth life and then to disintegrate life. If you've ever come across a dead body and you notice that it's filled with larva and flies, in their way of thinking, there was a supernatural deity who was in charge of decomposition. And so the religious leaders in Jesus' day in the first century began to use this name to describe the being who was in charge of all of the beings related to demons. And so the religious leaders will accuse Jesus of exercising miraculous power through Satan. I want you to think about what's happening. Jesus will later be accused of being possessed by Satan and controlled by Satan and motivated by Satan. And so Jesus is in effect saying, don't be shocked, don't be surprised, don't be intimidated when people don't accept what you say about what's motivating you. And so Jesus says, we won't fear persecution. Look at verse 26. Therefore, do not fear them. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. R remember what therefore is. In light of what I just said, don't be afraid. Why? Because 
everything, everything that you believe, everything that you say, and everything that you do, is, first of all, is going to be challenged. There are going to be people all around you who say, it's really not true. The Bible's not true. The gospel's not true. What the Bible has to say couldn't possibly be true. But what Jesus is saying is, that's exactly wrong. There's nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Jesus provides a powerful incentive against fear. Why? Because one day the truth is going to be known. The truth will pre prevail. The sinister cloak of evil that hides the persecutor's deeds will be stripped away. The truth will come to light. The testimony of the believer's faith will be exonerated and the wicked will be punished. Our persecutors will be seen and the persecutions will be seen as a light affliction compared to the weight of glory right now now, the gospel is hidden in part. Its truth is covered in part. But one day, all the lies will be stripped away and the truth will be known. Again, it's the question that you yourself asked before you became a Christian. How, could I, how can this possibly be true? What if what I believe isn't true? And over and over again, the reoccurring theme in the Bible is, no, it is true. No, it is true. You see, the problem of sin is still a problem. And Jesus is the solution to the problem of sin. It's true. The gospel is true. We don't have to be afraid. Why? Because the gospel is true. Again, when the person is in your face, when the person hates you or disagrees with you or is unkind or unfair with you, it shouldn't just simply be in the back of your mind. It should be in the front of your mind and the front of your lips. You should be able to say with complete confidence, I know that the Bible's true. I know that the gospel message is true. I know there's a real God. I know that the real Jesus is the living Lord and Savior. I know that he really did die. I know that he really did rise from the dead. I know that this is the only source of hope in the world. All the cloak, all the dagger, all the disguise, all the deceit, all the secrets of men will one day be stripped away and everyone will see the truth. Paul writes about it and he says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. One day, the Lord Jesus will reveal the abuse. He'll reveal all of the pain and the problems and the heartache that have been heaped on believers. The truth will be revealed. But I'm going to need to tell you one more thing. The truth will be revealed and dealt with and dealt with. Well, what about the damage to my home? What about the damage to my marriage? What about the damage to my, my career? What about the damage to my character and reputation? What about the, the pain and the difficulty that it's created in my family? The truth is gonna be known and the Lord will be vindicated and the Lord will restore your character and the Lord will restore your reputation just like he did with Joseph, just like he did with Daniel. Many believers are made objects of rejection and ridicule, but the true believer will be exalted according to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, with a far greater weight of glory. The true believer will experience, according to what the New Testament says, the praise of God himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. The true believer, the Bible says, will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of his father, Matthew. Matthew chapter 13, verse 43. One day, every single person who didn't believe you will say, you mean it was all true? Yes. No wonder Jesus says in verse 27, whatever I tell you in the dark, 
speak in the light and what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. Remember what we've already learned. Whatever I tell you in the dark, we preach the message given to us by the messenger. Our message isn't something that we invented. Our message isn't something that we make up. Our message isn't something in addition to the gospel. Jesus gave the message. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. So what does Jesus give us in the form of the message? I'm going to suggest to you it's the gospel. When does he give us the message? Look what it says. Whatever I tell you in the dark. The reason why I think that that's an interesting phrase is I think that it's, it's, there's a sense of intimacy and aloneness. It's something that he says to you when no one else is around. This is something that, again, you wake up in the morning and you're praying, you're reading your Bible. You're, you're, you're spending time with the Lord Jesus. And as you're spending time with him, he begins to speak to you about your life and about your family and about your ministry. What you hear in the ear, he says, preach on the housetops. What does it mean to preach on the housetops? I'm going to suggest to you it's an urgent message. We speak the message loud and clear. In the ancient world, if you go to the Middle East even now, or even down to New Mexico, you'll, you'll see that a lot of people, the Pueblo people, they lived their houses with flat roofs. They built kinds of, of places where you would spend the time especially in desert regions, on the cool of the top of the house. And so in the ancient world, people sat on their housetops. In the ancient world, when you wanted to have a party, their housetops served as their deck and their patio. They would cook up there. They would have fun up there. They would play games up there. They would have fellowship and conversation up there. In the ancient world, the housetop was filled with conversation. There was a song in the 1970s that went, what's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. What's the buzz? All of the buzz and what was happening would have been taking place on the rooftop. In our culture and society with social media and Twitter and all of that other stuff, you can go on your Facebook page and you can say, what's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. What's all the conversation? What's it all about? And so when he says, go to the housetops, I think what that means is we go to the place where the conversation is happening. And where is the conversation happening in your life? Your Twitter feed? Your Facebook page? Where is it happening? Is it at work? Is it in your home? Later, Jesus would say to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature in Mark 16, 15. And the early disciples were told to go and to speak in the temple to all of the people the words of this life in Acts chapter 5, verse 20. Paul told Timothy, preach the word, be instant, in season and out of season, rebuke or reprove, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. What Jesus has said to you privately, speak publicly and openly. Well, what if they want to hurt me? Verse 28, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Can we be hurt? The answer is yes. If you have a central nervous system, you can be hurt. If you're wired properly, you can experience pain. Jesus doesn't say, oh, and by the way, you won't experience pain. What Jesus is basically saying is, the persecutor can do no real damage. But in our mind and in our hearts, we sometimes think that it really is damaging. I could be hurt. I could lose my job. 
I could lose my reputation. I could lose, I could lose, I could lose. And remember, that's the essence of fear. The essence of fear is what I could lose. Here Jesus is saying, the damage is always limited. But they could hurt us in this life. Yeah. They could take away our health, our freedom, our substance. They could take away a lot of different things. And Jesus says they can't take away what matters most. They can't take from you what they never gave you. Let's repeat that. They can't take from you what they never gave you. And what has Jesus given you? Love, life, real freedom, forgiveness, hope, the promise of eternal life. The persecutor has access to the temporary, but the persecutor never has access to the eternal. We can be separated from life, but we can't be separated from eternal life. We can be cut off from a lot of things, but we can't be cut off from the most important thing. His love, his grace, his mercy, his compassion. Jesus has already argued that one day the truth will come out. Now Jesus argues the persecutor's power is always limited. I want you to think about that for just a moment. And I want you to tuck it away in your brain. I want you to be able to say, no matter how difficult it is for me, the truth is going to come out. And the person who's creating this problem, their power's limited. And once again, Jesus says in verse 28, don't fear, don't be afraid. Why? Does killing the body end your life? It ends this life, the physical life, the temporal life. But it can't destroy what God has given us in Christ. Don't fear. Why? Because we've been given a great and glorious cause to reach men and women with the gospel of hope and with the truth of the gospel, the freedom and forgiveness that's in the person of Jesus. And some people don't want that message. Some people violently oppose the message and the messenger. In order to communicate the love of Christ and the message of Christ, we sometimes become vulnerable to the persecutions of the enemies of Christ. But the risk of persecution is always seen in light of life's greatest reward. And that's the person who hears the truth, believes the truth, and is forever changed by the truth. But the risk of persecution is always there. A precious soul can be given hope, Peace, joy, freedom, life, forever. And so Jesus says, instead of fearing them, we're going to fear the Lord. Look what it says at the end of the passage in verse 28. But rather, in contrast to those things, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We can't always control our fear. So what does this mean? Is this an invitation for you to be afraid of God? Remember again what fear is. Fear in its most fundamental property is loss. And so here, what he's basically inviting the listener to do is to think carefully and biblically about the real God. Here, him isn't Satan. Here, it's the true and living God. It's the self-existent God. We're afraid we're going to lose something. So Jesus directs our fear to the one who's the sovereign Lord, who's in charge of all possessions, who's in charge of all life. The Lord God is in charge of our body. He's in charge of our soul. He's in charge of our possessions. The Lord God creates the universe. He creates the body. He creates the soul. He's, the, he's ultimately in charge 
charge of where we came from and where we are and where we're going. The passage, like I said, is a reference to begin to think about God the way the Bible pictures him. We always have choices. And our choice is always to be afraid of people or to be afraid of God. In what sense? We have to ask ourselves, what does the fear of man bring? We lose peace of mind. We become disturbed in our hearts. We lose our excitement and enthusiasm and, and focus. We become distracted from God's will. We focus on the body rather than the soul. We lose our sense of mission. We lose our sense of vision. We lose our sense of meaning. We lose our sense of purpose. That's what happens when you focus on what other people think. But what does the fear of God bring? Again, when the Bible speaks of the fear of God, it means a healthy respect. It means a reverence of his holy being and his holy attributes. God is holy and righteous and just and pure and merciful. He is kind and good. We are mindful of his holiness. We are mindful of his justice. We are mindful of his absolute power to execute justice in the day of judgment. But we live in a culture and a society that doesn't believe that even for a moment. You probably know people and you probably have already even said it to yourself. I don't believe in a God who would send somebody to hell then you don't believe in the God of the Bible. Let's put it a little bit differently. To the person who says, I don't believe in a God who would send anyone to hell. Okay, let me make sure I understand. You don't believe in a God who would send anyone to hell for any reason whatsoever or for every reason. You don't believe in a God who would send a person to hell. You don't believe in a God who is just and fair and righteous. In other words, you reject a God who believes that there is such a thing as right and wrong and that people who do what's wrong could experience punishment. This is the epitaph that was written on the tombstone of that great Bible teacher and Lover of God, John Knox, on his tombstone was written, Here lies one who feared God so much that he never feared the face of any man, unquote. He actually once confronted the Queen of England, or excuse me, the Queen of Scotland, with the gospel. In verse 10, when it says, or actually in verse 28, but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The word destroy doesn't mean to cause something to cease to exist in the original language, as some have suggested. The word in the original language is apoloia. The Greek word itself means the loss of well-being. It doesn't mean the loss of being. It means the loss of well-being. Some people could even translate this ruin. Some people wrongly teach that God simply annihilates creatures that rebel against him. The Seventh-day Adventist church holds that position. They believe that, that God will annihilate you because they believe in a God who wouldn't send a person to hell. But the Bible teaches that human beings are eternal beings. Walter Martin wisely said, if there is no hell, there's probably no devil. And if there is no devil, there's probably no sin. And if there is no sin, there's probably no savior. In the context of a personal God who has authority over every realm of human existence, it makes perfect sense to me that there will be people who say, I don't believe in a God who sends people to hell. So you don't believe in a God, a 
personal God who has authority over every realm of human existence, who knows the difference between right and wrong. And I want you to think about the context. Because if you miss the context, you're going to miss the point. The very next words out of Jesus' mouth in verse 29 are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. So let's pause for just a moment. I want you to think about the context. What have we learned thus far? One day the truth will come out in verse 26. The persecutor's power is always limited in verse 28. Now we learn that God deeply, personally, wonderfully cares about you. How do we know that? Sparrows were cheap. How do we know that? Two of them were sold for a copper coin. Being the nerd that I am, I actually know what this copper coin is. It's called a pruta. It's the smallest denomination in the Israeli culture. With one of these copper coins, it would take about a hundred of these copper coins to make one denarius, which was a day's wage. With one of these copper coins, you can purchase two sparrows on a stick. What does that mean? They're so cheap, they're so plentiful that they were used as finger food, as snacks at public gatherings and celebrations. You know how like when you go to the, the movies, you might get popcorn and a soda? Jewish people in the first century would get sparrows on a stick. Jesus reveals that God knows the intimate details of the common sparrow's existence. Not only is God aware of the sparrow's existence, but God is deeply involved in the minute details of the sparrow's life cycle. The sparrow isn't forgotten. The sparrow isn't ignored. One Bible teacher put it this way. He said, God attends the funeral of every sparrow. And I think that that's right. When the sparrow is born, when the sparrow lives, when the sparrow dies. The point that he's making is that the Lord is personally, intimately aware of every detail of your life. He goes so far in verse 30 to say, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I know what you're tempted to say. Well, that's easy for some people. Look what the text says. Don't forget what the text says. It says numbered. The very hairs of your head are numbered, not counted. He doesn't use the word counted. This will be important in just a moment. The stars in heaven. He knows every single one. The Bible says that God not only counts the stars in the sky, he knows each and every one of their names. The average hair count on the average head, 140,000 follicles. Now, I want you to do the math for those of you who love math. Multiply the number of hair follicles, 140,000, by 7.5 billion people on the planet Earth. Now we're talking about a lot of hair. We're starting to get into some large numbers. We're starting to get into a lot of information. What's interesting to me as I was doing the research on this passage, I came to discover that the average person also loses 80 hairs a day when they take a shower. So I'm looking out on the crowd and each of you, your, follicle, your hair count went down by about 80 per person. So keeping track of the number of hairs on your head, again, it changes every day. God knows the most interesting thing about you. He also knows the least interesting thing about you. 
and he knows everything about you. The Lord safely brought Noah and his family through a flood and he fed the prophet by the brook and he supplied the widow's crews of oil. He watched over the imprisoned apostles. He numbers the hairs on your head. And who is it that's counting? The one who said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Look what it says in verse 31. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. In this single and powerful statement, we're given a glimpse into the mysterious world of what theologians call God's providence. You may not know what that word means. God's providence is the truth that God sees everything, that he knows everything, that he cares and orchestrates all things, every event, every detail at the most minute level. The Lord God is omniscient, which means that he knows everything completely. He's all powerful, omnipotent, which means that he has all power. He's able to control all events in our life. God can and will control the minute details of reality. He sees all things and he causes all things to work together. He orchestrates them in such a way for those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. God loves and cares about the insult and the injury and the persecution inflicted on every believer. And so Jesus' invitation, it's not to be afraid of them, but to trust him. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 115, 12, the Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. So what does all this mean? God's knowledge is omniscience. God's power, his omnipotence, God's love and God's care are causing all things to work together in such a way that even the pain, even the sin, even the persecution, even the injuries, the injuries and pain inflicted on believers by evil men. God is completely aware of it. His ultimate purposes will be fulfilled because the Lord gives meaning and purpose and significance to everything that is your life. And so in verse 32, it says, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my father in heaven. So what does it mean to confess Christ? I think it means to tell the truth about Jesus. The word confess is hama lageo. It means to say the same thing. So I think that the implication is therefore whoever, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my father in heaven. The implication is we are to say what the father has said about Jesus. We are to say what Jesus has said about himself. We are to say what the Bible says about Jesus. And of course, I think it means to tell the truth when it's the most difficult time to do it. That's the context. It isn't to tell the truth when it's easy. It's easy for me to get behind this pulpit and open this Bible and say these words to people who are relatively supportive of what I'm saying. 
But what about when they're not supportive? What about when it's difficult? And of course, in the heat of persecution, the confession takes place when the words are hot and then the enemy's breath and the insults and the injuries and the abuse is being heaped upon us. This is in your home and in the classroom and in the courtroom and in the bedroom and in the boardroom. This is in the place where you've been called to live. And the Bible says, who is the Antichrist but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He's the Antichrist that denies both Father and Son. Whoever denies the Son, the same doesn't have the Father, but he who acknowledges the Son has the Father as well in 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. There are three couplets in the passage, a double confession, our confession of Christ before men and his confession before us, the Father. There's a double day of glory, the Lord's day of glory when when he hears us confess his name before men and our day of glory when we hear him confess our name before his Father. But then there's a double privilege and the double privilege is our privilege in confessing the Lord before men and then the Lord's privilege in confessing us before his Father. And what are the methods of the denial? We can deny Jesus with our word. It isn't just simply the words we speak. It can be the words we fail to speak. Denial takes place not just simply in what we say or what we refuse to say. Paul taught that we're not to be conformed with this world, but rather we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We deny Jesus when we fail to speak for Jesus. We're always at a crossroads between courage and cowardice. There's times when we have to speak. (laughs) A pilot offered a plane ride for $10 at a local county fair. This was at a time when $10 was a whole lot of money. And a farmer and his wife wanted to go on the ride, but they complained that the price was too too high. And the the pilot said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take you on the plane. And if neither you or your wife say a word, you'll get to fly for free. I won't charge you a dime. Fair enough, the farmer said. And they went up on the plane and the pilot went through some of the most amazing twists, the most amazing turns, the most amazing rolls. But he never heard a peep out of the couple. And when the plane landed, the pilot said, I've got to hand it to you. A deal's a deal. I didn't hear a sound. You must be a man of remarkable courage. And the farmer said, well, I was tempted to say something, especially when my wife fell out. You might think that speaking is dangerous. And you might be right. But failing to speak can also be dangerous. And the day is coming. And it's probably not too far away when the silence can no longer be tolerated. Jesus said, if you deny him, he'll deny you. So which is it that you prefer? The favor of men or the favor of God? You see, the ultimate question that I want to leave you with is this. How can we remain silent and remain faithful? How do we do both? The Bible seems to indicate the strong sentiment that that's not possible. So what do we do? Number one, we reveal the situation. 
Darkness thrives in cover-ups and deception and half-truth and whole lies. So what do we do? We speak the truth. And we speak it in love. We understand that the world is going to make a convincing case that the Bible's not true, that Jesus isn't the Lord, and that what you say and do doesn't matter. But you know that's not true. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the hearts. Remember, 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 remember. In verse 27, God will have the final say. Reveal the situation, but also reject Satan. We refuse to fear those who can hurt us or deprive us or kill us. We think death is the most permanent and lasting harm that can come to us. The Bible says it's not true in verse 28. The Bible says that hell is real. Speaking the truth in love sometimes brings threat. But the person who fears God is freed from the fear of men. The third thing is remind the saints. Remind them that Jesus loves them. The saints are near and dear to God. He loves and cherishes his own. He'll make sure that no permanent harm comes to you. Adoniram Judson was a renowned missionary to Burma, and he endured untold hardship trying to reach the lost for Christ. And for seven heartbreaking years, he suffered hunger and privation. And during that time, he was thrown into the Ava prison. And for 17 months, he was subjected to torture and mistreatment and unspeakable abuse. And as a result, for the rest of his life, he carried the ugly marks that were made by the chains and the shackles which so cruelly bound him. And undaunted upon his release, he asked for permission to enter the providence where he could resume preaching the gospel. And the godless ruler indignantly denied his request saying, my people aren't foolish enough to listen to anything you might have to say but I fear that they might be impressed by the scars on your hands and feet and they might be tempted to believe that what you're saying is true make no mistake about it you're suffering has something to say to everyone who's watching. The time has come where you have to ask yourself that serious question. Can I stay silent? Stay faithful? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you would give us a supernatural boldness. Lord, we pray that we would be able to speak the truth and that we would be able to speak it in love. Lord, we pray that we would be able to reveal the truth about the gospel. That we would reject Satan. That we would no longer fear those who can hurt us. And that we would remind each other that Jesus truly cares. And Lord, I pray for that person who still in the quietness of their own heart is asking and answering the question, what kind of a God is it that I really do believe in? Do I believe in a personal God who knows me and everything about me? That if God knows about the hair follicles on my head, that God must also know about the foibles, the faults in my heart. And that he's willing to forgive those. Wash me and cleanse me. Lord, I pray that you would speak to the hearts of men and women everywhere who don't know you. 
And Lord, I pray that you would speak to the hearts of the saints who are wondering whether or not they can in good conscience continue in silence. If ever there was a time to speak, we think, Lord, it's now to tell the truth now to speak of the consequences now, to remind people of your love now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.